of Jamaica between 1992 and 2006, is a distinguished son of the Caribbean who has held lead roles at the regional and international levels. Following his retirement from active politics, Mr. Patterson established and has led an international consultancy firm which provides a range of technical and advisory services throughout the Caribbean and the developing world. He is chairman of the International Advisory Board of the Caribbean Research and Policy Center, Incorporated, based in Washington, D.C., a think tank dedicated to in-depth research and analyses of the positioning of Caribbean states and issues related to international trade, development, the economy, society, politics, security, and the environment. The Antigua and Barbuda Reparations Support Commission is pleased to welcome him to this conference. Excellency, the Governor General of Antigua and Barbuda, Prime Minister, Honorable Gaston Brown, and Chairman of CARICOM, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, Dr. Julius Garvey, distinguished members of the platform and in the audience, members of the diplomatic corps fellow West Indians. I would like to begin, if I may, by extending a special recognition to the brethren and sisters of Rastafari who are present in this audience. I do so because they were among the first to carry on the struggle of our indigenous and enslaved ancestors for reparatory justice. In the post-colonial period, they continued to stoke the embers and to fan the flames of the dying reparation fire. It has now become an unstoppable conflagration. I would like also to applaud all the individuals, the institutions and organizations locally, regionally and internationally who have joined them in this reparation movement. Today represents a painful memory for the members of the platform and this distinguished audience. Professor Beckles reminds us that it is the 12th of October when Columbus lost his way. And everything has changed since then. Professor Vereen Shepherd has also reminded me that today, the 12th of October, marks the 149th anniversary of the Mor Moran Bay Rebellion, for which Paul Vogel was hanged because he dared to stand up and call for freedom of his people. As we hope this important conference, I implore all of us to see ourselves as working towards one aim and one destiny. The search for justice and repair of our societies societies which were disfigured by colonization, societies that continue to suffer the legacies of enslavement and native genocide. We need all hands on deck wherever we are located, in the west, in the north, in the south, in the east, because the tentacles of colonial injustices were spread far and wide, and their legacies continue to be far-reaching to this very day. Let us not delude ourselves. We in this audience are converts to the cause, but the masses of the Caribbean people 
are still to be brought on board the reparation train. They are stuck at halls and stations all around the region and indeed in the diaspora. They are waiting for a reason to get on board. If we do not wish to have them waiting indefinitely on the platform, or worse, boarding the wrong train, we need to use this forum to settle a number of unanswered questions around the struggle for reparatory justice. And today, deliberately, I am going to concentrate on just one of them, the question of Africa's role in the historic evil of human trafficking. The question has been asked, why do we make a claim for the persons stolen from Africa by the European colonizers and none from Africa? Such a question rests on a false premise that Africans in Africa were responsible or at least equally responsible for the historic slave trade. Supporters of that line of thinking assert that the transatlantic slave trade and slavery were extensions of an already existing system of slavery that was operated by Africans. And so these critics say the Africans must bear a moral responsibility for the transatlantic trade in human and African enslavement because they had set up a system that was only extended by Europeans. This is a falsehood intended to make a picture which would have the Europeans playing a subordinate role, where in reality we know the very opposite was the case. We must mount a public education campaign around this issue of African complicity. One should not place on a victim the guilt for a crime. So we should stop putting the guilt of the collaborator on the shoulders of the victim. The African continent was the victim of imperial exploitation and slavery. It suffered a massive loss. It resulted in a major depopulation of Africa with some of the brightest and the best. It destroyed age-old political traditions, undermined tribal systems, corrupted both moral and civil practices. In short, it crippled the potential for economic growth and social development. As Dubabaram points out, and here I quote, African slavery was based on a new world economy where plantations used forced labor were situated in one part of the world and an international system was set up to kidnap and transport Africans for these properties. End of quote. Indigenous African slavery was primarily based on captives in war and not on an economic system of plantation labor camps with its continuous need for imported labor. The infrastructure established to support the historic human trafficking of Africans was unknown in Africa before the mass exportation of our ancestors to the West. What the Europeans did was to lay down a brand new infrastructure. They built fortified forts along the African coast, which directed the process of kidnapping. They built a shipping industry of floating prisons that transported the captured human beings, and a system of production centers with forced labor plantations. The transport of the products from these centers to Europe 
the construction of factories for the processing of these products, a distribution infrastructure for the consumption of these products, and the banking and insurance sector to finance the whole process. The ideology of racism and the articulation of superiority and inferiority linked to race and color were absent in Africa before the transatlantic trade in Africa. It is a well-established fact that wherever slavery existed, it was much different in character, structure, and function from the chattel form that characterized the transatlantic slavery. And so, anything that happened in West Africa before this 15th century cannot be used as a justification for the European directed slave trade. So it was the slavery of the transatlantic slave trade that was foreign to Africa. And yes, some individual chiefs and African traders got wealthy from their collaboration with Europeans. But a Nigerian economic historian has pointed out conclusively that the net profit to Africa was zero and indeed they suffered an irreparable loss. Many African leaders did oppose vehemently the capture and transshipment of the people, while others were induced by intimidation or bribery or greed to collaborate in the capture and transport of Africans destined for slavery. There is no principle in law which permits the organizers of a criminal enterprise to escape responsibility because others collaborated in carrying out that enterprise. The principal felons cannot escape legal responsibility because there were accomplices. There is no statute of limitation which can exonerate or obliterate the memory of this most heinous crime against the human race. The most serious penalties under criminal law are reserved for those who organize a criminal enterprise and profit most from it. It was European nations who conceived the trade, put the enterprise into motion, into motion controlled its operation, and were massively enriched by it. Ladies and gentlemen, I find it amazing that people of African descent in our region are willing to forgive and forget the participation of Europeans in this crime against humanity, but continue to hold Africa accountable for the slave trade and slavery. The ships were built and outfitted from Europe, London, Liverpool, Bristol, Bordeaux, Nantes, Middleburg. The trade goods were manufactured in Europe. The weapons of war to force compliant by Africans came from Europe. The staff of the dungeons and the crew on the slave ships were primarily European. European institutions drew up business plans to set up forced labor camps in the Americas and organize the transport of kidnapped Africans from Africa to the Americas. They ordered labor, financed the system, provided the guns, and organized the ports along the coast as managerial center for the trade. Some Europeans are trying to divert attention by raising an argument about modern day slavery. And that argument is intended to appeal to the sentiment of wanting to do something good, but having to make a choice between two similar forms of injustice. No one should be asked to make a choice between two forms of injustice. Modern slavery 
is not embedded in the law of the nation. Colonial slavery was embedded in the law of the nation. Modern slavery is illegal. Colonial slavery was legal for the imperialists. It was the cornerstone of the world economy and built an infrastructure that was part of that economy. Ladies and gentlemen, we must never allow this most heinous crime to be obscured from human memory. We must never allow a distortion of history to exculpate those who designed, executed, and prospered from the pernicious slave trade. As one who belongs to the older generation of Caribbean leaders, I am here today to present that torch to a leader of the younger generation and to say, never let that torch be extinguished. And so, let us speak the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth about the transatlantic trade in Africans. And let us decolonize our minds. And let us get our scholars and our musicians and our leaders on both sides of the Atlantic engaged in this discussion for the sake of freedom and justice for all. Thank you.